Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, hold on. Damn, God, Lee. Hold on, son. Jesus Christ. Smacking on your bitch ass, he say my car go too fast. The auto got extensions because it spit out too fast. It'll be smoking egg rolls, that little shit go out. Something new for y'all, man. Hold on. Allow me to introduce myself, even though I don't need no introduction. My name is so dope, okay? Um, I got this. I usually don't do this on my channel, so we finna try something new. Where did it go? I had. I came home. First of all, if you know, I've been doing my pescatarian diet. Not at all. My, my stuff gone. I've been eating chicken. Goddamn Popeye's biscuit where I got some chicken. But I came home, I was eating. Looking at YouTube. And I seen this channel I just started watching. Dropped a video. Where'd it go? I watched like a minute. I was like, maybe I should watch uh maybe I should watch it. I mean react to it. In the winter of eighteen forty seven, George Donner, the co leader of the California bound group of American settlers, engaged in interest species protein reallocation in order to maintain metabolic integrity. Yeah, I didn't even see that title. Double speak, how to lie without lying. So basically, I don't know if you're gonna learn how to lie without lying. I don't want them to know how to lie without lying because I don't lie. I don't have nothing to lie. Or what I'm lying to you. Basically, this channel, what I've learned, bro, you're gonna get so much information, bro. This, this dude is so amazing. Like, my, um, my what's name put me on? My, uh, supervisor in the uh, Air Force, he put me on. Bro, this channel is amazing. However, his failure to fulfill caloric obligations in a timely manner rendered him unviable. This video is about doublespeak. What William Lutz, author of the book titled Doublespeak, defines as... Doublespeak is language designed to evade responsibility, make the unpleasant appear pleasant, the uh, unattractive appear attractive. Basically, it's language designed to... Kind of like, a, like finessing people? pretending not to. What line of work are you in? Waste management consultant. Let's say, for example, the person whose treacherous mountain climb my energy bar company sponsored cannibalized his climbing partner. It would be better for me to say something that technically communicates this information, but doesn't sound as terrible. Lutz says there are at least four kinds of doublespeak. Protein reallocation instead of cannibalism, and Tony Soprano's creative phrase to replace mobster would probably fall under the fourth kind of doublespeak, which is inflated language that is designed to make the simple seem complex or to give an air of importance to people, things, or situations. I don't know if that tape is working. You ate three desserts tonight. For parents, it's the watchword that triumvirate of Twinkies merely overwhelmed my resolve. The he just said, I don't know what he said, but... from George Orwell's hey. 1984. In the book, Double Think is a key concept. To know and not to know, to be conscious of complete truthfulness, while telling carefully constructed lies. Doublespeak, though, is rarely about deliberately lying. For example, in January 2015, Sid Miller became the agriculture commissioner of the state with the fifth fattest high schoolers in the country, Damn. Texas. So that Better. same year, along with announcing a plan to combat obesity, he announced updates to the school nutrition policy in Texas, which included rolling back a ban on the use of deep fryers and allowing the sale of low-calorie beverages in Texas schools. Why were by low calorie why would they not allowed? Means sodas. I guess a soda <coughs> is technically damn, lower damn, calorie damn, than, damn. say, a meal, but I doubt Coca-Cola is what you're expecting if you ask for a low calorie beverage at a restaurant. All right. Why do you have so many bowling balls? Uh, I'm not gonna lie to you, Mark. So long. So, double speak <laughs> becomes useful, obviously, when you're obligated to communicate something but are unable to straight up lie, yet communicating the truth bluntly or as clear as possible doesn't have the listener perceive the information in a way that you would like. For example, Basically when being words. asked about your current position during a job interview, you might think it would sound better to say, I'm currently economically inactive due to being offered an early retirement opportunity as a result of my previous employer's human resource redundancy elimination initiative. What? Instead of, I'm unemployed because the company was firing people and I got fired. What? Edward Sapir, in his essay, The Status of like Linguistics as Merge. a Science, says, language is okay. a guide to social reality. Human beings do not live in the objective world alone. 
but are very much at the mercy of the particular language which has become the medium of expression for their society. A lot of times we don't want information communicated to us objectively and unembellished. Euphemisms like passed away instead of died or big bone for fat are words or phrases that are usually used to avoid a distasteful reality. William Lutz says that this is the first type of doublespeak. You see, I don't like euphemisms. I don't like language that reflects fear and conceals the truth. Americans can't really handle the truth, so they invent soft language to protect themselves. And it gets worse with every generation. Sometime during my lifetime, toilet paper became bathroom tissue. <laughs> Used cars became previously owned transportation. And constipation became occasional irregularity. What? Poor people used to live in slums. Now, the economically disadvantaged occupy substandard housing in the inner cities. Hey, hey that's bad. They don't have a negative cash flow position. They're broke. Calling an economic recession a period of accelerated negative growth can be annoying, but certain forms of doublespeak are just... Accelerated seen. period of negative growth is a recession. In chapter 2, under the section, the doublespeak of graphs, Lutz gives a dated but clear visual example of doublespeak. Now, here is another chart. Their tax cut, so-called, is the dotted line. Ours is the solid line. As you can see, our tax cut keeps on going down and then stays down permanently. This red space between the two lines is the tax money that will remain in your pockets if our bill passes. Lutz goes on to point out that there are no numbers on this chart, which means that you have no perspective to evaluate it with. When you make the dollar scale from $0 to $2,500 rather than the awkward $2,150 to $2,400, it appears much less impressive. This kind of graphical doublespeak also appears elsewhere, used by the pharmaceutical industry for the heart-protecting, cholesterol-lowering wonder drug, statins. So here's the ad in which you see that Lipitor reduced the coronary events and risk for heart disease by 36%. So this was a really important study, the one that ultimately drove Lipitor to generate over $100 billion in revenue. Damn, so I'm $100 billion? Show you the actual data from the study, and it's right here. Uh, but here are the actual data from this study. And somewhere in here is a 36% risk reduction when you compare placebo with atorvastatin, the Lipitor. So if you look at survival, you see they're basically identical. No difference in mortality wow. benefit. You see that tiny sliver right. of a difference between the red and the blue bars? That is a 36% reduction. <laughs> yes. This right. is the wonder drug effect. This is the effect that propelled Lipitor to generate over $100 billion. Billion? Y'all not hearing him, though. How can that be a 36% reduction in risk? When you calculate it and you look at the data, the actual difference is 1.1%. This is where you do some statistical hijinks. You take that 1.1% difference between the groups. Then you have the difference between placebo and 100. If you're not following me, it doesn't matter because it's a silly. Right, exactly. It's, it's like, so you take the 1.1 divided by 3. What do you get? You get 36. Okay, that's 36%. And that's why they say there is a 36% reduction. And so, if you have truth in advertising, I think the 1% should actually be in the ad. Libitor reduces heart attack by 1%. Ten, we said 100 billion. By the way, if you're health conscious and want to limit your sugars, you might like to know that there are 56 different names for sugars. Don't like wow. the way just sugar sounds? How about wow. organic evaporated cane juice? A completely natural sweetener. This kind of rebranding of words. I've been trying to, to stop eating sugar too. To them is all over the place. Frank Lance doesn't do issues. He does language around issues. He figures out what words will best sell an issue. <coughs> In Frank Lance's book, Words That Work, he explains the importance of using the right word or phrase to evoke the right response from the listener. He says, it's not what you say, it's what they hear. Focus on those words that cause people to change their minds, change their behavior, yeah. even change their attitudes. For example, the gambling industry became the gaming industry and completely changed its perception, despite facts. nothing about the industry actually it's changing. Definitely facts. As Lund says in the book, gambling.
handling looks like what an old man with a crumpled racing form does at the track, or feels like the service is provided by some seedy back alley bookie in some smoke-filled room. Gaming is what families do together at the Hollywood-themed MGM Grand New York, New York, or one of the other family-friendly resorts in Las Vegas. Gambling is a vice. Gaming is a choice. He begins his work with something similar to a focus group. He talks to members of the target market and runs words or phrases by them to see what they like and dislike. You're going to use these to register whether you agree or disagree, whether you believe or disbelieve. The dials go from 0 to 100. Climbing, 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 changing fuels. One of his most significant political works has been getting the public to finally be against the estate tax. By removing that particular phrase from the political lexicon and replacing it with the more emotional, more personal, death tax. In his book, originally published in January 2007, Lutz says a clear but somewhat narrow majority of Americans today support eliminating the so-called estate tax, but more than 70% would abolish the death tax. It's the same tax, but nobody really knows what an estate is. But they certainly know what it means to be taxed when you die. I'd like somebody to get rid of the death tax. That's what I want. I don't want to get taxed just because I died. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just don't... One food rebranding effort was so successful that by 2002, the National Environmental Trust started a campaign to save a previously ignored fish species from being Lapia? eaten into extinction. In 1977, fish uh. wholesaler Lee Lance took Patagonian toothfish and renamed it Chili and Sea Bass, I believe, because he knew no one would have toothfish for dinner. So when people come to associate certain ideas with certain words, it's useful to come up with new words that evoke a more pleasant reaction. For example, a hospital may think that you wouldn't react well to hearing that a catastrophic blunder killed your wife and child during a cesarean delivery. So it's better to describe the anesthesiologist having turned the wrong knob and giving the mother a fatal dose of nitrous oxide as a therapeutic misadventure. At least St. Mary's Hospital in Minneapolis in 1982 thought this wording would be better. Three weeks ago in Los Angeles, the uh, surgeons killed the patient in a series of incidents that the pathologist called oh, incredible stupidity and incompetence that included slitting the patient's throat during surgery. What the? This was called a therapeutic misadventure. What? William Lutz says the second kind of doublespeak is jargon, the specialized language of a trade or profession. It is useful and necessary to know jargon to Wait, I get, bro. So they said, he said, he said something about lack of intelligence and he snapped, I mean, slit the throat or whatever. And that counts for a therapeutic misadventure. Therapeutic mean like he was slow or like messed up, retarded. Well, not, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to use harsh words, but he was tweaking when he did the procedure. Misadventure, death. Hey, might be on the phone, so though. Double speak or not depends on where that same exact computer look like. For example, describing your computer keyboard key to your friend as a catastrophically buckling compression column switch and actuator huh? is unnecessary, but is an appropriate descriptor to use in a patent. After giving President Reagan a routine physical examination, Dr. Daniel Rouge said that previously documented decrement in auditory acuity and visual refractive error corrected with contact lenses were evaluated and found to be stable. What? That sounds a lot more impressive than saying the president's hearing and eyesight haven't changed since his last exam. Where is the organ electrically detectable? And finally, William Lutz says the third type of doublespeak is gobbledygook or bureaucraties. Basically, such doublespeak is a matter of piling on words of overwhelming the audience with words. There are plenty of examples of politicians using bureaucraties when forced to comment on something that they really don't want to comment on, but a good example is NASA's ex-associate administrator Jesse Moore's performance in terms of the lexicon he was operating under. After the 1986 Space Shuttle Challenger disaster, Jesse Moore was asked if the performance of the shuttle program had improved with each launch. He answered, I think our performance in terms of the liftoff performance and in terms of the orbital performance, we knew more about the envelope we were operating under, and we have been pretty accurately staying in that. 
And so I would say the performance has not by design drastically improved. I think we have been able to characterize the performance more as a function of our launch experience as opposed to it improving as a function of time. Sure. Pretty much everyone will at some point dress up facts in some kind of way, even in our day-to-day -day lives. People use doublespeak because from a young age we learn that consequences exist. So tell me, did you eat the chocolate cake? You gonna lie? Just because someone uses doublespeak doesn't make them a crook, but when you don't quite understand what is being said about something important to you, it's good to ask, what exactly is this person saying? For example, you might be looking into investing and come across words like subprime mortgage or collateralized debt obligation. It would be good to clarify for yourself specifically what that means. So the banks started filling these bonds with riskier and riskier mortgages. By the way, these risky mortgages are called subprime. So whenever you hear subprime, think shit. Hold on, so mortgage bonds are dog shit. CDOs are dog shit wrapped in cat shit. Yeah, that's right. And something I've been wondering lately, what does detox mean? It seems there's hundreds of products promising to detox your body, but what exactly is being detoxed? Cadmium or mercury? Reactive oxygen species? Benzene? Wouldn't it be nice to know which toxins are being detoxified by which product? So I could make sure to drink this when I've taken way too much aspirin, or take this for my excessive use of BHT containing cosmetics. Maybe this detox tea product could help me detoxify metals or PCBs or, or something like that, but I wouldn't know because all I can find about the ingredients is that they are time proven to help your body with the detoxifying process. Wow. What the hell are you talking about? The conversion of that movie. The following thought experiment is brought to you by Brilliant. In 1955, Tom Ewell was sitting on the floor of his house drinking champagne with Marilyn Monroe. The glass of champagne constantly produces gas bubbles on the bottom, which rise to the surface. Suddenly, a bout of appendix pain causes Ewell to drop his glass. What happens to the bubbles in the glass as it falls? A. New bubbles form and rise just as they did before. B. New bubbles form, but they never start rising. C. All the rising bubbles fall to the bottom. Or D. All the rising bubbles remain fixed in D. place. D. Want to know the answer and explanation? Check out Brilliant.org, a website designed to make topics like physics, math, logic, and computer science fun and engaging. With daily the challenges the video? like the champagne glass one, and over 50 interactive courses that you can eat. Alright, man. Thanks for watching, man. Hey, I know that's a long video. I dropped a long video yesterday. But if you really mess with me, or you want to, even if you just want to learn something, like, like you learn some stuff today. Like, that's why I mess with the channel. But thanks for watching, man. Leave a like, comment, subscribe if you're new. Follow me on all the social media. That's why I drop. I drop. You will know if I drop the video because I'm instantly. Come on, man. All right, man. <laughs> all right, man. I'm so dope. I'm gone. Yeah.